Hello everyone, my name is Ravishan. Welcome to the second episode of What Makes This Scene Great. This is not a book review, rather an old school appreciation. I take a look at a scene from a given book, show you what the author is trying to do and how effectively he has managed that. So the book that we are going to be looking at today is Chinaman by Shihan Karunathilaka. This is a book from my home country, Sri Lanka. It won the Gracian Prize in 2009 that's a local literature prize. Then it went on to win the DSC prize as well as the Commonwealth Book Prize in 2012. Before you comment, Chinaman in the context of this book is not a racial slur, it's a cricketing term. Cricket is a game similar to baseball but with a whole lot of old world manners and stiff postures thrown in. And Chinaman is a bowling action, a particularly cunning one. Yes, Sri Lanka is a real place, cricket is a real thing, we not only have mass graves and tea, we also have literature. Well at least we have this book. So what's this book about? This book is about W.G. Karuna Sena. I'm gonna call him W.G. for short. W.G. is a retired sports journalist, alcoholic, dying of a toxic liver. He has failed as a father and has been an inattentive husband and when he hears his death sentence from his doctor, he decides to redeem his life. How? by going dry and doing a character turnaround? No, by writing a book about a forgotten cricketer. Obviously. Reasonable and self-aware does not an interesting character make. So this is a story about redemption, but redemption beyond the grave. So who are the characters? We have W.G. Karunasena, also known as W.G. We have his sidekick, Ari Ratna Bird, also known as Ari Bird. And then we have Pradeep Mathiv, the titular character. He's the neglected genius, cheated out of his career, doctored out of historical records, calumniated and forgotten. The background for this book is the Sinhala and Tamil civil war. During the time that this book is set, the 1990s, the war is at its peak. Enough has been said about the civil war in Sri Lanka. You can read up about it if you want to. There's a whole part of the internet where competing narratives and propaganda try to win you over to their sympathy. The bottom line is, both sides forgot that life is precious. Anyway, while the war is going on, Pradeep Mathiv happens to be a minority Tamil playing the white colonizers game cricket in the Sinhala majority south. So it's an interesting setup for a novel. Our man Pradeep Mathiv, in the author's words, is a man who is doomed in no particular order, wrong place, wrong time, money and laziness. Politics, racism, power cuts and plain bad luck. So you see, this also happens to be the story of Sri Lanka. So the scene that we are going to be taking a look at today is split between the two sub-chapters Punch Up at a Wedding and Slideshow. What is the author, Shehan Karunathilaka's purpose in this scene? I'll be breaking it down to four main points. One, set up the social class of our heroes WG and Ari Bird. Two, to introduce us to WG and Ari Bird, the dynamic between them, and also set up Newton Rodrigo, their nemesis. Three, make them fight. Four, give us an introductory glimpse to Pradeep Mathiv. So where is the scene set? It's the wedding of a cricket celebrity. Point one, social classification. The sociological positioning of WG and Ari Bird, our main characters, is key to the plot. It gives the narrator and the reader access to the whole Sri Lanka necropolis, from the sewers of corruption to the penthouses of power where the party is still going on. WG and Ari Bird take us like rats and map out the whole Sri Lanka. This is a bit of scene set up from page six, just to get you oriented. We are at the wedding of the great Lankan opening batsman, or the Glob, as we shall call him. The Glob is a man of the people and has invited to his wedding members of the press, ground staff, and a sprinkling of international cricketing celebrities. 30 tables away, Graham Snow and Mohinder Bini are swooning over a gaggle of girls. Both were former players who became commentators and then became players. The buffet table has seven types of biryani. Next to vats of chicken, Tiron Kure, the Minister of Sports and Recreation, is laughing with Tom Watmore, the then coach of the Sri Lankan cricket team. And this is where it begins. A wedding, especially in Sri Lanka, is the perfect place for a sociological study. The table arrangement radiate money and pedigree in decreasing proximity from the bride and groom. From where you are seated, who you are seated with, people can deduce your salary, your surname, the school you went to, and the car you drive. So where does WG and Ari Bird occupy? These are the men that I have spent my years with, and they're all drunk. Failed artists, scholars, and idealists 
who now hate all artists, scholars and idealists. Our table sits 10. The journalists, coaches, ground staff, B-grade cricketers, C-grade friends. Me, Ari, Newton, Brian, Renga, Elmo, a Pakistani from the Associated Press, his friend and a young couple who looked lost. So leaving aside the anomalous placement of the young couple, the rest of the crew that we're going to spend our time with, that's the well-lubricated middle-class parasite. This is very important because they can get in and out of parties, invited or uninvited, and take us to where all the important conversation takes place. This book, much like everything else in Sri Lanka, and probably Sri Lanka itself, is built on gossip, conspiracy theories, delusions, mythomania, and just plain fake news. If you're landing in Sri Lanka, you gotta be careful. Like Jupiter, you might just fall right through. So number two, set up WG and Ari. How does the author accomplish this? WG and Ari are the Don Quixote and Sancho Panza of our story, questing after the ever-elusive Pradeep Mathis. Newton is the nemesis, sabotaging our hero's quest and later we find out playing a formative role in Pradeep Mathis' life. There's a dramatic payoff for this animus, why Newton hates our heroes, but I won't ruin the ending, so that's as far as I can go. WG has already been introduced to us by this time. When he goes to meet his doctor and is given his prognosis, about 10 years if he goes vegan and does crossfit maybe, a year or two if he cuts down to two drinks per day. Our hero responds, thus it was settled. I would attempt to do a half a decent documentary on Sri Lankan cricket. There's nothing more inspiring than a solid deadline. That I believe is characterization enough. Now that we know who WG is, who is Ari Bird, his sidekick, and Newton Rodrigo, the nemesis? So this is the beginning of the scene, punch up at a wedding. In the buffet corner, weighing over 100 kilos from the bridegroom's hometown of Matara, sports journal, talent broker, amateur coach, Newton, I came to eat not to be insulted, Rodrigo. In the champagne corner, weighing under 180 pounds, Teacher, preacher, video fixer, uninvited guest. Ari Ratna, I have watched every test match since 1948, bird. Ari is my neighbor and my drinking partner. I have smuggled him in and he has smuggled in a bottle. The Oberoi was in Ari's usual watering hole. He has tanked up already at somewhere far less plush. I should have expected trouble. If you have read literature from the former colonies or even honeymooned in the Commonwealth, you have already met Ari Bird. He's the Eurasian retiree with the old school tie and Irsad's British code of honor, the half sober voluptuary crashing parties, toppling tables and getting into trouble. He's usually the Don Quixote of Sri Lankan English literature. You would have seen a shade of him in Cecil Prince Von Bloss, the protagonist in Karl Muller's Jam Fruit Tree. This kind of hijinks virtuoso is easily prone to implausible and tiring caricature. But Chihan Karunathilaka succeeds in this book by not making Ari Bird his Don Quixote. Instead, Ari Bird is demoted to Sancho Panza, and with his drunken brawls and hijinks marginalized, we can follow WG along his obsessive quest. And that, in my opinion, is a victory for Karuna Tilaka, the author, knowing who to cast as your main character and who to pair as his sidekick. The first scene sets up their dynamic perfectly. With WG and Ari Bird out of the way, who is Newton Rodrigo? So Newton is the kind of talent scout who preys on major talent in minor league and gives them a shot at fame for a lifetime of blackmail. We've seen that character before and I suppose he's a kind of vermin that exists in any kind of sport. Newton has made a lot more money than any of us. Quote, for me, of course, journalism is a hobby, a calling pocket money." Unquote. Newton brings young cricketers to Colombo and sells them to clubs. He also studies race sheets, politically and literally backing the right horses as always. I know this pudgy man as well as I know the gentleman who was dousing him in gravy. We get to know more about Newton Rodrigo later in the book. So this standoff between our heroes and Newton is where the book starts and this antagonism goes on. Read the rest of the book. I promise you there's a nice payoff. So then we come to point three, making them fight over Pradeep Mathis. So now we know the kind of company that WG and Ari Bird kept. Imbibing so much fuel, these folks are easily flammable. Fighting is not as much of a problem as making them fight at the right time, at the right moment, on the right topic. Karuna Tilaka's job here is to make them fight but over Pradeep Mathiv, a minor forgotten cricketer 
from Sri Lanka no less. The Sri Lankan cricket team before 1996 when we by fluke when we won the Cricket World Cup. A sports team that not even a drunken maniac would bet on. It's interesting to see how Karuna Tilaka can get these people to fight and make a segue to Pradeep Mathiv, our main character. Now we move on to the slideshow part of the scene. The drunken journalists at the table are creating a slideshow on paper napkins. They are nominating their candidates for the Fantasy A team, a transnational, transtemporal list of greatest of all times. This is the bravura section of the scene. Long, complex setup and a very distant payoff. Fantasy A team on a slideshow of paper napkins, a natural detonator for a fight, and the payoff is making them fight over Pradeep Mathiv. So how does Karuna Tilaka, the author, achieve this? It's all in the dialogue. I'll break it down into two sub points. One, pacing. Two, the use of asides and interruptions. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. But let's start with the obvious one, pacing. So Karuna Tilaka sets up the party, the time, the place, the ambiance of glitter, and then zooms in on the table of regrettable invitees. So he doesn't start with an argument about Pradeep Mathiv. What he does is a gradual build-up. At the beginning, we have the table in relative consensus. Everybody agrees that Clive Lloyd is a titan, Sri Lanka sucks, and that Renga is an unregional hack. We agree that Lloyd's team were literally head and shoulders above the rest. Elmo offers that Bradman's invincibles were invincible only because of Bradman. You eliminate him, good team. Invincible? That I don't know. We all drink a toast to Clive Lloyd. The young couple slink off to another table. Newton is petulant throughout. Out him, he couldn't even draw a two-day match with Bradman. Don't say that, says Brian. We beat New Zealand. So then we have fragmentation. The first counterpoint raised by none other than Newton Rodrigo. Rather than give everyone at the table individual, well-rounded characters, Karuna Tilaka sort of summarily characterizes them and flattens them out so that we can focus on the main antagonism between WG, Ari, and their nemesis, Newton. So Newton happens to be the single counterpoint at the table and starts spoiling for a fight. So now we have an image of the party, the a table of drunks, not a fight yet, but at least the beginning of a disagreement. Hold on to that image just for a moment. Let me move on to sub point two, the use of asides and interruption. What I mean by this are examples of the author you condensing dialogue into prose or indirect reportage. In novels, dialogue has to be centered on a dramatic pivot. You can't just let people ramble on and eventually get to a kind of dramatic fork in the roads. The fillers, non-sequiturs, detours of normal conversation, these things are only signified in literature. They're not represented as dialogue per se. It's not just a convention of novel writing, it's also the way our memory works. Just think about the last bar fight or dinner walkout or hissy fit that you had. You probably remember the dramatic landmarks of the conversation, maybe the irksome table manners of the person you punched or yelled or spat at, not the placid small talk. Now let's go back to page 10 where we froze the frame, the party and the initial stage of the disagreement and let's see how the author uses asides and interruptions. Newton is petulant throughout. Our team couldn't even draw a two-day match with Bradman. Don't say that, says Brian. We beat New Zealand. The dance floor writes with famous names and dolled up women who do not belong to them. From the roar of the house band and the machinations of the dancers, it is evident that the alcohol denied to our table has been flowing freely on the other side of the room. Understandable. Dolled up women prefer to have their bottoms pinched by international cricketers and not by those who write about them. The Pakistani journalist begins scribbling on napkins. As the only man with the table, with an education outside of Asia, he convinces us with diagrams and eloquence that the perfect cricket team should be composed as such. Two solid openers, three aggressive batsmen, two genuine all-rounders, one agile wicketkeeper, two unplayable fast bowlers, one genius spinner. Having the Pakistani journalist take charge of the slideshow of napkin is also a point where the author was clever. If you let them just naturally coalesce into a plan, it would take pages and pages of back and forth and bickering. It's far easier to have the Pakistani journalist who's the outsider at the table take charge. Seduced by his path and lilt and logical arguments, we nod collectively. The Windies were great, but not perfect. No spinner, no all-rounder. Lloyd had four types of hurricanes at his disposal, 
the elegant holding, the belligerent Roberts, the towering Garner, and the fiery Marshall. Who needs spinners, counters, and argumentative Newton? Booze flows and conversation splinters. Now the disagreement is amping up, but what I want you to pay attention to is that section where suddenly everybody is seduced by the path and lilt of the Pakistani journalist. Whatever the hell a path and lilt is and whatever its charms may be, it works for narrative economy. Rather than have all of them just argue each point of that formula, uh, you just have them nod to the outsider and then have Newton as the sole counterpoint. What's important for the author is to keep reminding that Newton is spoiling for a fight and that WG and Ari are going to at some point be pitted against Newton. If you make everyone fight, the reader is just going to get confused. So I'll move on to sub point two, using interruptions in dialogue. The idea of interrupting dialogue, like that example where when Newton first begins to spoil for the fight, the camera sort of cuts away and looks at the writing and buttock pinching on the dance floor. When you build up to a dramatic sort of landmark, you don't just continue hammering that on the reader's face. You can cut away and let the reader understand that the build up is going on on the side. The main idea is to give the reader an impression of the passage of time. Normal conversation takes hours and hours to achieve what Karunathilaka, the author, is trying to achieve in this one scene. So you need to give an impression of the passage of time to the reader rather than fill page after page with dialogue. So what you do, or what Karunathilaka, the author, does, is move the camera away, describe something else so that the reader starts counting time. And when the camera cuts back again, Newton is still not agreeing with anyone else. This happens again in page 13. Fight continues with Newton getting steadily angrier. Someone has dared to suggest the name of Pradeep Mathiv to fill the one genius spinner quota of the greatest of all time team. Why Newton behaves the way he does right now, you will understand later. I step in. I saw Lindsay in 63. Mara reflexes. John T. Rhodes is nowhere. He jumped in front of batsman to take a catch at Silimidov. You bloody drunkard. It was 66 says Newton. You all are idiots. Matthew can't even make the current side. And in the economy section of the crystal ballroom, gobbling chicken biryani amidst famous acquaintances, Ari and I begin telling them about the multiple variations, the prize scalps, the balls that defined physics, and the legendary spell at Askiria. No one believes us. Newton calls me a drunk a few more times. I call him a bribe-taking pimp. The rest of the table retreat while Ari begins slurring. And as the temperature rises, I look around and see the man himself in a circle of people, looking lost. At his side is a pretty girl. Whispering in his ear is the Indian skipper. Hanging on each syllable are career reserve Charit Silva and Sri Lankan cheerleader Reggie Ranwala. So that's the camera cutting away to Pradeep Mathiv. Mathiv is glaring at me, as if he knows his name is about to cause a brawl. As if he knows I will spend the next five years searching for him. As if he knows he will never be found. And then Newton calls me a talentless illiterate who should be writing women's features. And then Ari stuffs the chicken into Newton's open mouth. And then all is noise. Just pay attention to the build up between that last insult and the first punch. The author doesn't just describe the continuum of violence escalation. He cuts away to Pradeep Mathiv. And that is what I mean by the use of asides and interruptions. The idea is when you cut back, you realize, oh, shit has hit the fan. So this right here is craftsmanship. Now that we've got Ari Bird and Newton Rodrigo eating each other's fists, let's cut away point number four, the introductory glimpses to Pradeep Mathiv. So a caveat here. Pradeep Mathiv is not so much of a character as much as he is an elusive mystique. I think the model here was Somerset Moham's Moon and Sixpence. Just like in that book, we never get to see Charles Strickland. We never really meet in this book Pradeep Mathiv. Several times, WG and his sidekick Ari Bird come close, but they lose the scent. Um, I don't want to spoil the ending, so. So this scene is very important because this is our first glimpse at the ghost that we are going to be chasing for the rest of the book. It's gotta be interesting enough to hook us into the chase as well as WG. We won't understand or sympathize with WG's obsession unless the author gives us enough to hook us in right now. Matthew is glaring at me, as if he knows his name is about to cause a brawl, as if he knows I will spend the next five years searching for him, as if he knows he will never be found. 
and then Newton calls me a talentless illiterate who should be writing women's features and then Ari stuffs a chicken into Newton's open mouth and then all is noise. So immediately after the fight erupts, of course, the bride and groom notice and of all people, the bride intervenes. We are turning pages backwards in this book because uh, the narrative is a bit of back and forth, jump cuts and flashbacks. Newton and Ari knock into veteran scribes Pali Tapa Sekar and Rex Palipane and I decide to intervene. I gulp down the last of my rum, but before I can offer my services, the bride of the glob enters, shining under yellow lights, a delicate petal, bouquet in hands, tears in eyes. The flower drops her bouquet and screams in an accent that sounds like Sydney, but could be Melbourne, in a voice that is anything but petal-like. Get the fuck out of my wedding, you fucking assholes. We can take a fist from a brute, but not a curse from a bride. The waiters assist us in packing up the fight. Released from Ari's gin-powered grip, Newton picks up a mutton curry with intent. Put that down! The glob descends on the scene. Yana Metani, Get out! Both Newton and Ari heed the great man. With the glob is Ravi Dimel, has been fast bowler. He looks for the softest target, finds it, and snarls. Ah, Karuna Sena. Who else? Kindly take your friends and bugger off. Fearing unfavorable press, the glob puts on his man of the people smile and pats me on the back. Don't get angry, Mr. Karuna. Wife is a bit upset, don't you know? As we are led out, I see a dark man with a crew cut. He's leaning on table 151, surrounded by sycophants. Indian Captain Zaharuddin is chatting to him, though the man doesn't appear to be listening. Our eyes meet and he raises his hand. I return the wave, but he has already averted his gaze. That may or may not have been the moment that started what you're about to read but it was most certainly the last time I ever saw Pradeep Sivanathan Mathiv. So notice that is the last time that we see Pradeep Mathiv as well. We don't really get a dossier on the shadow that we are about to chase, but we do get this image of a blunt-mannered iconoclast who doesn't return compliments, is aloof of sycophants, brooding in the middle of all the attention he's getting. And that's enough for us to read the next 400-something pages. So there you go. That was Chinaman by Shehan Karunathilaka. And that's what makes that scene great. If you haven't read Chinaman already, I recommend you to do so immediately. You should also check out his uh, new book, Chats with the Dead. Really cool cover. Arrived recently, so I haven't read it yet. So did you agree, disagree? What do you think about that scene? What is your favorite scene from the book? Please comment below. Like and subscribe. Okie dokie. Over and out. See you when I see ya.